Every community has legends, their own myths and fables that add to that region's culture. And most of the time, those legends are on the spooky side. Like the Falk Monster, a Bigfoot-like creature that has been terrorizing Falk, Arkansas since the 1940s. And the focus of the 1972 film, The Legend of Boggy Creek, a docudrama style movie about the many true sightings and encounters with the Falk Monster. This movie was created and directed by Charles B. Pierce an advertising salesman who made this movie after reading all the reports of the monster. He borrowed $160,000 from a trucking company and hired mainly local kids and actual people who encountered the monster. The movie premiered in 1972 and reportedly made over $20 million from both movie theaters and drive-ins, slowly becoming a cult classic over the next few years. But now, 50 years later, The Legend of Boggy Creek is forgotten. It has about 4,000 ratings on IMDb and 6,000 views on Letterboxd. And this is because there was never an official home release of the movie. The only DVDs and VHS tapes that were released were bootlegs with really poor quality. But luckily, Charles B. Pierce's daughter Pamela bought back the rights to The Legend of Boggy Creek and found an original source of the movie. So thanks to her, there's a brand new restoration available which looks so much better. And I'll get to share why this small indie film from a community of less than a thousand people is special and shouldn't be forgotten. The movie begins with a message. This is a true story. Some of the people in this motion picture betray themselves, in many cases on actual locations. Right off the bat, we are in for something special. We cut away to the sights and sounds of the bottomlands. We see the different wildlife that lives in Boggy Creek. We see lizards and beavers and turtles and birds. And we hear so many frogs. Frog ASMR. Ribbit. Ribbit. Yeah. We get so many wildlife shots in this movie, and they're great at establishing the setting and environment where this creature lives. But I can't get the funny image out of my head of a full-on film crew, a little dinghy, just paddling through the swamp. I don't know, that's funny to me, I guess. All the wildlife goes crazy when they hear it. The cry of the Falk monster. <laughs> A child also hears the beast's cry, and he's booking it through the field. And I don't know why, but this shot reminds me of an anime. He runs into the store and requests help from these old Joes who are gonna go turkey hunting. The boy says there's a wild man in the woods and wants these guys to go down and kill him, I guess. And they laugh at the kid not believing his tale of the woods monster. So the boy leaves. He's running back home through these fields and I love this scene. You know when it's really late at night and you're turning off all the lights before going to bed? And when you turn off that final light, you speed walk or you run to your room because you're afraid a demon or a skinwalker or a gnome is gonna get you? Yeah, this scene perfectly captures that feeling. Except this kid isn't running away from imaginary monsters. There is really a beast out there in the woods somewhere. I'm so scared right now! He makes it home in time, and as he looks out the window, it's revealed that the narrator of the movie is this young boy, now an adult. He explains how the monster's cry was terrifying as a boy, and it still terrifies him to this day. After the opening credits, the narrator, who's named... Uh, it's, uh Let me check the wiki real quick. Um, oh, Jim. Jim gives the audience some information on Falk, Arkansas. It's a small, tight-knit community of about 350 people. It was small in the 70s, and it's still small now, only having a population size of about 800. Falk is in the southern end of Arkansas, right near Texarkana. Jim explains how this town is big on fishing and hunting, and I think now is a good time to explain the basic structure of this movie. It doesn't follow the normal movie structure with a coherent story or characters. It's a docudrama. The movie is a bunch of recreations of actual encounters with the Falk monster that are held together by Jim's narration. And like the opening message said, these vignettes sometimes star the actual people. Like our first two named characters, Smokey and Travis Crabtree, a father and son who like fishing and hunting. We get more info on the land, how it's mostly used for farming and has an interconnected creek system, and it's just a swell place to live. Until the sun goes down. Everything's all nice and cheery until that sun goes away. Later that night, we get our first attack. Outside the house of Willie E. Smith, the old man from the store we met earlier, the Falk monster attacks a dog, throwing the good boy on the porch. So Willie does what any American would do. Yet my 
gun. He fires around, but the shell jams. It seems weird to me they didn't do another take of that shot. My only theory is that because Willie is most definitely shooting actual shots, he didn't want to waste the ammo. I don't know, that's just a funny thing I noticed. Willie now believes the monster is real and goes back inside for safety. We meet John P. Hickson. A farmer who tells the brief story of his encounter with the beast. It was wounded, walking on two legs, but ran off before John could get a closer look. We cut to John W. Oaks who tells his story on the beast. It hopped over his fence, killed two hundred pound pigs, and carried them off into the woods. John and John are both played by their real life counterparts. We are then introduced to Fred Crabtree, who is played by Jeff Crabtree. I don't know if that's a stage name or someone else named Crabtree is playing to Fred or something. I, I, I really don't know. He's a farmer who likes to hunt, and when he strolls up to this river, Fred is now face to face with this giant creature. He slowly takes out the squirrel shot and replaces those shells with buckshot, which if you don't know what buckshot does, he doesn't shoot though. Fred is unsure what this thing is. Is it a beast? Is it a man? Is it a furry? Before he figures out what he sees, the beast wanders off into the woods. Now we meet James Crabtree, played by Buddy Crabtree. While squirrel hunting, he lights a cigarette. Smoke of the bear is about to kick your ass, dude. You better put that out. <laughs> he sees glimpses of a hairy monster in the woods, but it walks off before he can react. We transition to another story, focusing on Mary Beth, her older sister, her sister's baby, and their mother. And this story starts off really spooky. Mary Beth goes outside to get some water from the well, and I honestly don't know why, but this scene deeply unnerved me. Why is it so scary all of a sudden, man? It was all like peaceful and nature shots a minute ago. It was so silent and slow, I kept looking at the tree line or behind the fence to try and find the monster. This scene captures the paranoia you feel when you're alone and it's quiet. You know, when you go out to take out the trash or to grab the mail and you feel like someone is watching you. She hurries back inside as we cut to nighttime. Okay, I have to give a warning. This next scene is very upsetting if you're a cat lover. I'm not gonna show anything graphic on screen, but a cat is about to die and it's very sad. Mary Beth is sitting by the fire and reading, but when her kitten starts meowing, she takes it and lets it outside. You just let your kitten out into the woods? Not the kitty, man. Now, I know some cats are outside cats while others are inside cats, but I feel like when you live in an area that has alligators, bobcats, wolves, and a Bigfoot, maybe all cats should be inside cats. And as the Falk monster approaches the house, the cat starts going crazy. Mary Beth looks outside, sees the beast, and passes out. The monster leaves, but not before. Next morning, they would discover their dead kitten. No! Completely unmarked. No! And I was, uh, I was not okay watching this. I want this monster dead, man. I want his head, and I want it on this piano. We cut to this young boy who hears barking dogs. Because he thinks he's gonna get himself a deer, he runs into the woods with a shotgun. And you guessed it, he runs into the Falk monster. This kid shoots the monster, which made me really happy. Shoot him! Shoot him again! I'm telling this kid to, to, to shoot this big monster. I guess, I guess the American in me is starting to come out. Now, this movie is slowly starting to fall into a bit of a pattern. A person wanders into the woods or is home alone, sees the monster, gets scared, story over. But here, 20 minutes into the movie, we get a refreshing change of pace. Now the locals of Falk are striking back. They pull up with hunting dogs and gunmen on horseback. <laughs> They're gonna kill him on horseback. God bless America. Although this militia is short-lived, as when they find the monster, it scares away the horse and the dogs are too scared to do anything. So yeah, we're gonna have to add that to the scorecard. Monster one, hunter zero. Jim explains how the monster became much more scarce after that. Hunters would go into the woods to find it, but no luck. Time passes and while no one has seen the creature in quite some time, the fear of it doesn't go away. This scene does a good job at capturing the mass hysteria Falk Arkansas went through during this time. This is a community of hunters and fishers who are now hesitant to hunt and fish, except for the absolute Chad, who is Travis Crabtree. This kid cannot be bothered that a monster lives in the swamp. He's so unbothered that he has his own theme song. Hey, Travis Crabtree. 
Travis is taking a weekend camping trip in the woods and he makes some eggs. And I don't know why, but eggs in the middle of the woods, they they slap. They just do. He paddles over to Herb Jones, a man who's been living here for 20 years. This guy does Yo, not pay taxes. And, and you know what? Like I respect it. He doesn't talk to people very much and he does not believe the Falk monster is real. We then meet this couple driving down the road at night. <laughs> See how fast that dude was sprinting? He had places to go. The Falk monster has returned. We cut to a farmer named O.H. Kennedy who has found a strange footprint in his field. A bunch of reporters and smart people examine the footprint. They rule out gorillas, orangutans, and anything that would normally live in the woods. And this really scares O.H. You get a funny feeling that uh, something's wrong. Get scared. Grab shotgun. Transition to Betty Smith and her three children who rush home after playing out by the woods. Now, I could be wrong, but I believe one of these kids is played by Pamela Pierce, the director's daughter. She's listed in the credits as child, and these are children. IMDb does say one of these girls is her. I'm just not sure which one. The kids tell Betsy about the monster they found by the woods. They drag her out to the field and point out where they saw the monster. Oh! Oh, that's a problem. The monster pops out like scarce. Hey, what's up guys? It's scarce here. And the family runs away. We get another road sighting of the monster, this time with a cool cameo. That's Charlie Walter. It's Doc from Cars. One night, three teenage girls were having a slumber party when they began hearing strange noises from outside the trailer. Their unease turns into full-blown panic when whatever is outside begins trying to get inside. The girls struggle to load the hunting rifle. It's a real shame that they were drinking Coca-Cola and so speed cola. And when one of the girls looks outside to investigate, we're treated to this wonderful freeze frame. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why they did this. This movie is technically lackluster in a few different ways. Scenes in the dark are poorly lit to the point where it's essentially just a black screen. The pacing isn't great. The movie is like 30% nature shots. And there are things like this freeze frame, products of low budget independent filmmaking and while i can sit here and say oh this movie sucks because they don't know basic lighting techniques blah 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 or something like that the legend of boggy creek isn't great because it's this technical marvel that will transport you to another world it's great because it's a small humble movie made by people who care and now we cut to the most important story of the movie it takes up a big chunk of the screen time and is probably the most notable sighting of the falc monster two families move into this rented house the Fords and the Turners. And when they move in, it's all cheery and fun. This is like the beginning of every horror movie ever. Like The Conjuring where the family goes to the new house and all oh, they're so happy. Later that night, the men go to work, leaving the women and children home alone. The monster wanders onto the porch of the house, but the women act quickly, barricading the door so the creature can't open the door. Since when did this guy learn how to use doorknobs? Anyway, it loses interest and leaves as the two women get help from the landlord. He doesn't find anything and the family survives their first night. The next morning, Bobby Ford and his son go fishing by the creek. The boy gets rightfully scared when he looks over and sees a big old footprint right there in the mud. Yeah, that's looking fresh. Later that night, the boys are sleeping in the living room when they start to hear noises. The same noises the women heard yesterday. The creature has returned. The whole house wakes up and we get some top tier acting. Yeah, she's a professional. They don't seem scared as much as they just seemed annoyed. Like, oh man, this guy's back again. Last time he tried to sell us insurance. The men grab their guns and do a sweep of the surrounding area, but they come up empty and retreat inside. And just as things are beginning to calm down. Oh! <laughs> he learned how to open a window. They race outside, fire a few shots, and scare the creature away. And I have to say, the film's lighting limitations make this scene kind of funny. We pretty much only ever see the climax of the movie from this angle, I'm guessing because they couldn't properly light the surrounding woods. And while it is goofy, I think it works within the context of the film. It gives the whole final sequence a claustrophobic feel. The policeman shows up, but finds nothing. He sees a footprint from underneath the house and says it's a panther? Yeah, that's definitely a panther. He gives the families an extra shotgun and goes home. But the night of terror isn't over for this family yet, as the patriarch goes to relieve himself. Oh! <laughs> 
This scene perfectly illustrates the utter terror I go through when I use a bathroom with a window. The men run outside and fire rounds at the lunch thief. That damn Sasquatch. And as they go to confirm the kill, Bobby is attacked. But he manages to escape the beast's grip in the funniest way possible. <laughs> He's running so fast. <laughs> I mean, come on, he went through the door like the Kool-Aid man. Th that's just funny. Even though he was hurt, Bobby ends up surviving this encounter. As he finishes up his narration, Jim, now an adult, goes back to his childhood home. He ponders on the different sightings of the Falk monster and hopes to hear that terrible roar one final time. Just to remind himself of the unsolved mystery that is Boggy Creek. And the credits roll. The Legend of Boggy Creek isn't a good movie in the traditional sense. It has some poor filmmaking, some slow editing, and a lot of bad acting. But the movie is humble. Charles B. Pierce and this community sent out to create a movie that can share the folklore of the Falk monster. And they did just that. Everything in this movie is genuine. From the stories, to the people, to the locations. And more than anything, The Legend of Boggy Boggy Creek is a piece of history. It's a time capsule of this area in this time period. And because of that, this movie deserves to be remembered. And I'm so happy with this brand new restoration. I did just spoil the whole thing, but I recommend you check out The Legend of Boggy Creek yourself. You can stream it or you can buy a physical copy, which is what I did. It has some really nice artwork on the slipcover and it comes with a signature from Pamela Pierce herself. Also, it's shipped in a themed bubble mailer, which is a nice touch. I'll leave a link to their eBay store down in the description. The Legend of Boggy Creek is a fun and spooky movie. If you want to watch a video on another movie with spooky elements, click here to watch my Ghost Rider video. You should click on it. It's right there. Just go ahead, click on it. You'll be happy, I promise.